morning too, so I'm with you. But I will tell you, it's a lot easier to stay awake standing up here than it is sitting there. However, we uh, a couple years ago we did chapel over in the uh, recital hall, and it's much more conducive to sleeping than these chairs. So hopefully you'll stay awake. Actually, I think you will stay awake because this morning we're going to do something that some of you really like to do. How many of you have ever eavesdropped on someone's conversation? Anybody? All right, most all of you. How many of you have not only done that, but you, you kind of enjoy it sometimes? Anybody? All right. Well, why are the rest of you doing it if you don't enjoy it? <laughs> There's just something that sometimes makes us curious. We walk by people, we hear a conversation, we think, you know, I'm just going to listen into this conversation. This is interesting. Or there's something I want to find out. Well, in just a few moments, we're going to do a little eavesdropping, if that's all right. So uh, we're going to get there in, in just a moment. Yesterday, we, we launched into what we're going to talk about this week and next, for you that will be here with us next week, about living for the glory of God. There's nothing greater in life than to live for the glory of God. And this morning we're going to look at what I believe is the most pivotal issue in living for the glory of God. Something that you have to get and someone that you have to see if you're going to live for the glory of God. And that's Jesus. And I think it's kind of cool that we're celebrating our Christmas in June this morning because I had planned to talk about Jesus. And Jesus came into this world. We celebrate it in December. He probably wasn't born in December. He made sure we didn't know what day he was born because he knew we'd make some sort of idol out of it. But Jesus came into this world supernaturally, born of a virgin. And he came, we talked about yesterday, that he lived a perfect life. But he had a controversial message. And he made controversial claims. And so we're going to talk this morning about the controversy of Jesus. In our culture today, Jesus is extremely controversial, isn't he? You know, it's fine to say that you believe in God. Almost everyone you meet, there are a few, but almost everyone you meet will say, yeah, I, I believe in God. There's a God out there. There's probably a God. I, I believe in God. I pray. Most people would have that belief. But then when it comes to Jesus, the controversy really sets in. And Jesus made some very controversial claims. His teaching, his identity. And we're going to look at that this morning. And in order to live for the glory of God, you need to see Jesus for who he is. And you need to respond to his claims. For some of you, my heart this morning is that you will see Jesus for who he is for the first time and understand why you need him in your life. And for many of you who already have him in your life, it's my prayer this morning that you will be strengthened and encouraged in your belief about who he is. Because living out your faith and living for the glory of God in the world that you live in is challenging. Because people will challenge you. They'll say, it's not intellectual to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. It's not smart. It's not rational. It's not reasonable. And so I want you to be strengthened in your faith so that you can live out your faith boldly and confidently. Controversy. Jesus was controversial. How many of you like controversy? Anybody? How many of you hate controversy? All right. The rest of you, I guess, are somewhere in the middle or not awake. <laughs> Some people just love controversy. They love an argument. They love a good debate. They love a good discussion. Other people avoid it like the plague. They don't like conflict and they don't like controversy. There's so many opinions about Jesus. Well, not everybody believes in Jesus. Almost everyone has an opinion about him. Well, he was a great teacher. He was a moral example. He was a, a great leader. He was influential. Some people say he never lived. Some people are sure he lived. Some people say he was God. But this morning, I want us to look at what Jesus actually said about himself. And so we're going to be in John chapter 8 this morning. So if you have your Bible there, I want you to, to turn there. And I want you in John chapter 8 this morning to see Jesus with me. We're going to encounter Jesus having a conversation with a group of Pharisees. And it's going to be quite interesting. We're going to eavesdrop on that conversation. Would you like to do that this morning? We're just going to kind of fly back a couple thousand years and we are going to just eavesdrop in on a conversation that Jesus has with some Pharisees. Would you like to do that this morning? Alright, we're going to do that. We're going to eavesdrop on Jesus' conversation with some Pharisees. And as we do that, I want you to see Jesus for who He is. Alright, Jesus was not 
just someone who went around and gave everyone a hug. All right? There's that view of Jesus today. He didn't just affirm everything and everyone. He had some very radical claims, very controversial claims. And I think it's interesting that every major religion acknowledges Jesus. Now, aside from Christianity, they don't see him for who he is. But they feel a need to acknowledge him. In Islam, they acknowledge Jesus. But he's neither God nor God's son. In Judaism, Jesus is neither God nor God's son. Hinduism, they see Jesus as one of many gods. Buddhism acknowledges Jesus as one of the enlightened ones. Humanism sees very little value in Jesus and some doubt his existence at all. Mormonism, Jesus is one of many spirit children from Heavenly Father and Mother who had a relationship. Jehovah's Witnesses see Jesus as a created being. The New Age movement sees Jesus as just some sort of limp-wristed hippie that wants to give everybody a hug. It's true. But is that who Jesus was? So in John chapter 8, we're going to drop in on this conversation. Now, we're going to begin in verse 12. But just to set the context, earlier in this chapter, Jesus is teaching. And while he's teaching, just sort of imagine it's like this. You know, we're, we're gathered together and there's a group of people listening to Jesus. And not, I'm not trying to say I'm Jesus, okay? Don't, don't take the illustration too far. And they're gathered around and, and the, he's teaching. And all of a sudden there's this big commotion. And a group of men drag this woman up in front of Jesus, right in the middle of the sermon. All right, so that, that message kind of wrapped up. And they said, Jesus, we, we found this woman in the act of adultery. What should we do? The law says that we can stone her. What do you say? Now, they were wanting to trap and, and put Jesus in a hard spot. And so Jesus says nothing. But he stoops down, remember? And he starts writing in the dirt. We don't know what he, what he wrote. can only imagine what was going through that, that woman's heart and mind, fearing that she's probably about to be stoned to death. And when they ask Jesus, what should we do? He says nothing. Writes in the dirt. They're waiting and waiting. And finally Jesus says, go ahead and stone her. And they're like, what? He says, only condition is, whoever has no sin, you get to throw the first stone. And all of a sudden, you hear rocks dropping. After that, Jesus starts the message back up again. And that's where we are in John chapter 8, verse 12. And you have to understand now, the Pharisees are really upset with Jesus. They're angry. They're mad. They don't see him for who he is. They don't believe his message. And so in John chapter 8, we're just going to work through this conversation that Jesus has with these Pharisees. And it's, it's, really, it's really sort of fascinating because they're going to have quite an exchange, quite a back and forth. And they're going to find out, they're going to have this whole sort of who's your daddy thing, all right? Now, in our culture today, like if you really want to make fun of somebody, guys, you know this, right? If somebody makes fun of your mom, how do you feel? Come on, somebody tell me. You beat him up. Thank you. All right. Somebody got the answer right. Thank you. Yeah, when someone picks up, like, the worst insult you can do for a guy is to pick on his mom. Well, in this culture, in this day, it was more of a dad thing. All right, so we're going to see that. John chapter 8, verse 12. Look at what Jesus says. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now I want to ask you a question. Have you ever bragged or overstated yourself or your abilities? I mean, I'm going to mostly ask this side of the room because for whatever reason, uh, guys have a tendency to do that. How many of you have ever bragged and maybe overstated, you know, okay, you know, we, we want to make ourselves look better, feel better. You know, when a bunch of guys get together to talk and, and one guy's telling a story, you know what the other guys are doing? They're thinking about, do I have something that could top that? <laughs> And so when the other guy, the first guy finishes the story, they're like, yeah, that's great. But there was this one time I, 
And it might seem at first like Jesus is sort of overstating who he is. I mean, let's go back. He says, I'm the light of the world. That's a pretty, pretty big claim, isn't it? I mean, most of us wouldn't go around and say, I'm the, I'm the light of the world, right? Nobody would say that. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Well, this upsets the Pharisees. Look in verse 13. And they challenged him. They said, here you are appearing as your own witness and your testimony isn't valid. They're like, you, you can't make that sort of claim. They, they're calling him out and they're like, no way. They're like, if you're going to make a claim like that, you need to have at least two witnesses. That was part of their culture. They're like, you need two valid witnesses to testify to a claim like that. So Jesus says this. He says, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards, but I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. And so, pause there for a moment. Jesus sort of makes a statement. And then he brings up the whole two witness thing. And the Pharisees, I'm sure, are thinking, okay, he's going to call a couple witnesses. Who's Jesus going to call as his witness? A Samaritan woman? This adulterous woman? Who's he got? He's, he doesn't have any witnesses. He doesn't have anyone credible. Right? Because if, you, if you're going to have a witness, they need to be credible, right? I mean, if you're, if you're all familiar with a trial, right, and as lawyers are picking through the witnesses that they're going to call to stand, one thing they want to make sure of is what? That they're credible. Because if they're not a credible witness, they're going to, their testimony won't be valid. It'll be dismissed. It'll be overlooked. And so I'm sure they're wondering, who's he going to call? So look at verse 18. Jesus says, let me tell you who my witnesses are. He says, first of all, I am one who testifies for myself. He says, I'm my own witness. I call myself to the stand. So Jesus says, I've got two witnesses for you, me and the Father. And so they ask him in verse 19, they says, where is your Father? Now, of course, you need to back up and understand Jesus' earthly father was Joseph, but he wasn't his real dad. And everybody knew that. Everybody had heard the story about Mary getting pregnant before they were married. And when you go around saying, well, an angel showed up and told me I was going to have a baby, you know how many people believe that? All right? Not many. They're like, uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, we know how it works, Mary. That's not how it works. <laughs> So they're like, where is your father? They're going to get into this whole back and forth about who's your daddy. They're digging at Jesus. Verse 19, he continues. He's, Jesus says, you do not know my father or me. He says, if you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Once more, verse 21, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin for where I go you cannot come. And this made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says where I go you cannot come? Verse 23, but he continued, you are from below, I am from above. So Jesus is making claims about his origins. He says, you're, you're from below, you're from earth, but I'm not from here. Alright? He says, I am from Above. I'm from heaven. You're of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He, and you will indeed die in your sins. And so Jesus is proclaiming His deity. He's proclaiming that He's God, and He's proclaiming that He is the pathway to God. And so in verse 25, they say, Who are you? to make these claims. Jesus is just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Verse 26, I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not have, they did not understand that he was telling them about his father. Verse 28, so Jesus says, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I have nothing on my own, that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. When Jesus talks about being lifted up, we may not get that right away, but they got that. To be lifted up in that culture and context meant one thing, crucifixion. 
To be lifted up was to be lifted up on a cross. And so Jesus says, when I am lifted up, when I am executed, when I am crucified, he says, then you will know that I am he. Verse 29, he says, the one who sent me is with me, and he has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And verse 30 says, even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. So as Jesus is giving this message, there's people listening, and they hear the words of Jesus, and they believe in him, and they trusted him. But the religious leaders and the Pharisees did not. To the Jews that believed him, verse 31, he says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, my followers. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 33, they didn't like this at all, by the way. This whole thing about being set free implied that they were slaves. And they're like, we're not slaves. Look at what they say. They're like, we're Abraham's descendants. We're, we're, we have descended from Abraham. Listen, we have never been slaves of anyone. They're like, how dare you tell us that we need to be set free when we have never been slaves? And Jesus said in verse 34, very truly, I tell you that everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, Jesus says. I, I, I know where you come from. He says, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from me. Your father. <laughs> now it gets interesting. He says, I I'm telling you about the father, but he says, you are doing what you heard from your father. Different father. Jesus just took things to another level, and they know it. So look at what happens in verse 39. They say, Abraham is our father. <coughs> Wait a minute, our daddy's Abraham. All right, Jesus, let's make this clear. We know where we come from. We can trace our genealogy, okay? We didn't have to go on Ancestry.com. All right, we get it, Jesus. We know where we come from. And Jesus says, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you were looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham didn't, did not do such things. And you are doing the works of your own father. And again, he's implying that Abraham really isn't their father. He says, your own father. And they're getting hot. They're getting mad. They're getting angry. And so they say this. We're not illegitimate children. And not only were they trying to say something about themselves, but they were trying to say something about Jesus, weren't they? They're like, oh, by the way, Jesus, don't you remember? You're not really legit. We don't know who your daddy is. We don't really think it's Joseph. You're illegitimate. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus says in verse 42, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. And now Jesus is just going to go, gloves off. You ready? He says, you belong to your father, the devil. Your daddy's Satan. That's pretty extreme, isn't it? And Jesus just dropped it. He says, your father is the devil. Jesus is blunt and he's forceful in what he says. Look at verse 44 as he continues. He says, you want to carry out your father's desires. For he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, and there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. And they are still mad. So look in verse 48. They say, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan? You're a half-breed? They hated the Samaritans because they were of mixed descent. They had been Jews who were scattered when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and they intermarried with foreigners and they moved back and they were 
looked down upon. They're like, you're a Samaritan and you're demon possessed. You've got a demon in you. In verse 49, Jesus says, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. A radical claim. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets, and yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham? For he died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? They're like, Jesus, who do you really think you are? Did anybody ever tell you that? Did your parents ever say that to you? <laughs> All right. They're like, who do you think you are? Jesus said, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, who you claim is your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar just like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. They're like, you're not even 50 years old. Verse 57. And you've seen Abraham? Very truly, Jesus said, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. And they couldn't take it. Because to a Jew, when they heard the word I am, they heard the name of God. That was how God chose to reveal himself. Remember when Moses encountered God? He said, who should I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am sent me. And so when Jesus says, I am, he was claiming deity very clearly. There are so many people today who want to say Jesus never claimed to be God. But he did. And you have to see Jesus for who he is. If you're going to live for the glory of God, you have to see Jesus. He is the most pivotal thing in all of human history. What you do with Jesus Christ, how you respond to Him and His claims is the most important thing that you could ever, ever do. Verse 59 says that they picked up stones to stone Him, but Jesus hid Himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Every time they tried to kill Jesus before His time, they couldn't do it. Even though there was many of them and one of Him, He would just walk away. Because Jesus didn't die as a victim. The cross didn't happen because Jesus was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The cross didn't happen because Judas betrayed him. All those things merely played into the hands of God's eternal plan. Because it was Jesus' plan from the very beginning to come and to die. He died of his own choice and his own will. He died to make a way for you and I to be right with God. He claimed to be God and the way to God. Jesus is controversial. Because he made the claim, John 14, 6, the night before he died. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, I am the way to God. I am the pathway to eternal life, to heaven. There's no other way. No religion can save you. No amount of good works can save you. He says, I am the only way. I am the only pathway to God. And that's why Jesus is so controversial. We live in a world today that says it's wrong to claim exclusivity about truth. And that there has to be many ways to God. And whatever you believe is okay as long as you're sincere. But Jesus made it very clear that that wasn't true. Because the Pharisees were very sincere in their belief. They were very dedicated in their religion. But they were very far from God. And Jesus says, if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. But will have the light of the world. Of life. In verse 24, he says, I told you that you would die in your sins. And then in verse 51, he says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. That day, there were some that believed in Jesus. That's what we read back there in verse 31. But there were many that did not. And today, I want to point you to Jesus. And I don't know all of you. I don't know your background. I don't know your story. I don't know where you've come from. But I know one thing about you. You're just like me in that you have rebellion in your heart against God. You're a sinner. We've all missed the mark. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. I don't care what's in your past. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter. None of us measure up. None of us are good enough for God. 
That's why Jesus came. That's why he lived the life that we couldn't live. He died the death we deserve to die. He rose from the dead. Did you know that there's accurate, historical, reliable information about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Our, our faith isn't built on some sort of empty, jump off a bridge, leap into the dark kind of belief. Even critical scholars who don't believe in God, who don't believe in salvation, will tell you that 1 Corinthians was written by Paul in the first century. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul makes an extensive case for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the reason he makes such a passionate case for the resurrection of Jesus is because he saw Jesus himself. Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, intersected his life, and changed his life forever. And Paul went from being someone who persecuted the church to someone who followed Jesus with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his soul, and all of his strength. And if you're going to live for the glory of God, you have to see Jesus for who he is. And you have to respond to his claims. Jesus said, if you don't put your faith in me, if you don't trust me and believe on me for salvation, if you don't receive the forgiveness that I alone can give you, you will die in your sins. You will be cut off from me. You will spend eternity separated from me. And you will justly pay for your sins in hell. But the cross screams out to us and says, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to live a life apart from God. Jesus bridged the gap. He paid for your rebellion. He paid for all your sin, past, present, and future. He died in your place. He took the wrath that you deserve. And if you will see him for who he is, and you will believe on him, and you will trust him, and say, God, I believe and I understand that Jesus is your son, that you sent him into the world. He claimed to be God. He demonstrated that he was God. He did miracles that showed the power of God. He predicted his death and his resurrection. It was witnessed and attested to. And he says, if we will place our faith and believe on Jesus, that God will forgive our sins, he'll adopt us as his child, he'll put his spirit in us, he'll give us the opportunity to live for his glory and his kingdom, and he'll give us the opportunity to live in his presence forever and ever. You have to respond to Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life is what he said. Church won't save you. The right denomination won't save you. Only Jesus can make you right with the Father. And you have to place your faith in Him. For you that have, I want you to know that your belief in Jesus will be looked down upon. You will be called a bigot. You will be called narrow-minded. You will be called foolish. And increasingly so. But know that Jesus was who He claimed to be. And it's not being narrow-minded because Jesus said the way is narrow. He's the only way. And we can hold up that truth with love and grace. We don't have to be ignorant about it. We don't have to be mean-spirited about it. But we must point people to the fact that unless they put their faith in Jesus, they will not experience the kingdom of God. They will not experience eternal life. And they'll die in their sins. And I want you to be confident in that belief. I want you to be able to leave here and say, I know other people will look down on me. I know other people won't get it. But I believe and know who my Savior is. I know that He claimed to be God. I know that he demonstrated that he was God, that he died and that he rose from the dead, and he's my hope and my faith. But if you've never done that, I want to point you to the fact that your greatest need is to trust Jesus. The greatest question that you'll ever deal with in life, the greatest thing that you'll ever do is your decision about Jesus. What will you do with Jesus? Would you bow your heads this morning? If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, there's just this one thing I want you to know. There is a God in heaven who created you. He made you in His image. He loves you. And He loved you all the way to the cross where He gave His Son for you. Jesus lived. He died. He rose from the dead. He's the only way to be right with God. And you can know that you're right with God simply by asking Him, receiving. The Bible says we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, that He's our Savior, that God will forgive our sin, past, present, and future. He'll adopt us into His family. He'll make you His son or His daughter. He will fill you with the righteousness of Christ. He will invite you into His kingdom now and forever. It's eternal and permanent. All you have to do is tell Him from your heart to His. And if you've never done that, I want to encourage you to know that He is who He claimed to be, and you can trust Him. And for you that, that know Jesus as your Savior already, I want you to leave here confident in who He is and willing to take a bold stand, even though it's going to be controversial. 
because God's looking for young men and young women who will live boldly for Him to be difference makers and world changers. Father, I pray for each person here this morning. Father, you know their heart. You know their need. And Father, I pray that if they need you as Savior, if they've never experienced the forgiveness and the freedom from their sin, Father, if they're still a slave to the sin that's in their life, Father, I pray that today they would find you and know you and trust you and experience the joy and the freedom that come from a relationship with you. Father, I thank you that you gave your Son on the cross for me and for the whole world, even though I'm undeserving, even though we're all undeserving. And Father, I thank you that there's freedom from sin and there's opportunity to live for your glory, even though we don't deserve it. And Father, I pray you help all of us to be confident and bold in our belief, in our faith, in your Son, Jesus Christ. We love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to number 100.